and I'm going to be talking today about bringing the outside inside, and this journey I've had the last year with exploring the use of virtual reality in the classroom. Um, the highs and the lows and the sideways on that, uh, with, with the company of technology. Am I okay on time? I guess, oh, now I'm 745. Okay. All right, so um, as probably many of you uh, have this experience, at, at, I'm a, a predominantly uh, teaching institution. Um, there'll be a, a phrase that really gets into the BPAA's lexicon, and they're saying it every two seconds. So ours constantly is chirping on about active learning ecosystem. It means good teaching, uh, but you know, ALEs constantly. And uh, I, I don't know what the, the buzzword is for, for your institution, but it's like they read something and then it loops uh, eventually. But um, there's so many ways and so much expertise in this room for the way that we look at active learning ecosystems, right? So we, we do labs, um, we have in-class activities and demos. Bonnie is wonderful for that part. We say, here, well, not the last talk, touch this plant, not, not the hobby. But most of the time, you know, let, let's get engaged with uh, the natural world. And, um, and it can be you know, inside and outside, and of course field trips and, and uh, excursions during the semester and that kind of thing. Um, and one of the key pieces, the way that, that I promote an active learning ecosystem, is the use of research to get undergraduates really transforming into thinking like scientists and acting like scientists. And research is a, a huge component of the undergraduate experience at Maryville University. It's part of the required uh, the biology degree. Um, we have to do at least one semester. Um, the students that I have, I, I try to get four or five out of them, um, definitely. But um, where they're engaged in the community and, and all the professors within my department, within their respective realms, are doing research with undergraduates with an aim towards an education outcome in that respect. So that's all peachy. And I've been in Maryville for eight years, got tenure. <laughs> um, and that's great. But I'm in St. Louis, and I teach botany. We're holding the thin green line, as I call it. We have pure plant classes. We're up to three of them now. Um, and I teach botany in winter semester. <laughs> so it doesn't matter how many resources I have or where I can take the students. It's February in St. Louis, and there aren't plants. And this became, and this is just something that really, really uh, is frustrating. And um, particularly if you want to do like research projects, you know, that, that ideal where you have a research project that is the lab that spans several weeks in the classroom, and the students are doing some original data sets and that kind of thing. Not a lot of pollinators. And then with shifting in our climate, uh, I found that even if I was like, okay, well, well, we'll move the pollination lab where we go out and start looking at pollinators all the way to the end of the semester. Honestly, April 10th, three weeks out from the end of the semester, one, the students are done. They do not want to start a big project in the lab at that point. Uh, but two, there's a good chance in Missouri, it still might look like that. And then the next day it won't, and the next day it will again. Um, so there's just, you know, this is the natural world I live in. So one of the places that uh, I collaborate with a lot of research at is Shaw Nature Reserve. And it was out here working with the students that I started to think about what are more creative ways that I can bring this experience that we were having during the summer with my research lab into the classroom. <clears throat> so a little background on Shaw, it's about 30 miles from our um, university's front door. Um, it is part of the Missouri Botanical Garden. It has, it has a wonderful set of different habitats. You have grassland, uh, prairie glade, forest, wetland, lots of different habitats to really explore great diversity of plants, etc. But it has the same problem in that when I'm teaching botany, that's that same location. Um, so, you know, how do I deal with that? So at a conference I saw, and it was not in the realm of biology, some folks were using the 360 cameras, uh, virtual reality. My experience at this point in virtual reality had been yelling at my teenage son to get off with the video games. No more of that, right? I failed spectacularly in that area. Um, but I went, okay, so a lot of times from entertainment we go, here's where perhaps it's a, a tool we can use. So we called it the 360 Project, and the university, although it will be very frustrating about funding plants, is always up for a new tech toy. And um, now, this doesn't mean that I got like 
a full set of Oculus. Like it wasn't, you know, that. No, 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 no. This was like the, the $30 headsets that you stick a phone into and, and that kind of thing. But the software to create it, and I even got, this is Sam Harris, bless his heart, he doesn't like the outdoors. Uh, he runs all of our IT at Maryville, and he came out with me for one day at Shaw, bringing the cameras. That was the only day, and after that he said, you know what? Have the cameras. <laughs> <laughs> outdoors not for everybody. Um, and, uh, and so we had a lot of local expertise, uh, James Traeger, who just recently retired from Shaw, and we started to build content. and. Uh, developing this virtual reality classroom that would be out at Shaw Nature Reserve. And I want to kind of walk you through the pieces of that because it was a pretty steep learning curve for me as well. First of all, when you, this is a little camera. When you take images with this, um, you end up with a lot of like, is this thing on? This is like a three, you know, he's staring at like, I, I don't know. Um, lots of images where you can see like my bum sticking out from behind a tree because um, you try to get to like remote trigger these. Um, one of my students is actually here in the room. Uh, was the brave soul, shout out to Xavier for laying down in tall grasses to get all the ticks on him so he could hide while he got the images for us. Um, but the upshot of this is you get, you get something that is disturbingly called a skin. And a skin is a 360 image like this. And when it's flattened out and you build into it, it looks like this. Um, and so at this point, I collected skins from all over the world. I got skins in uh, the Galapagos Islands. I got skins in, down in the Yucatan. I just got some skins uh, hanging off the cliffs of Moor. Um, I say disturbing things to my colleagues, saying, oh, where are you traveling? Could you pick up a skin for me? Uh, I, I sound a little like a cannibal or something like that, you know, roaming around <laughs> looking for skins. Because each one of those is a new habitat or a new ecological landscape that I can build content into. In this case, our first skins, whoops, were at, uh, at Shaw. And then you've got to get content. That's videos, photos, infographics, web links, data of all kind that you can build into teaching modules, which is what I was after. So um, my lab did this, in, it, we did a pilot in the summer of 2018, where we chose six locations across the habitats represented at Shaw, and we tracked it with about every <clears throat> three weeks, we took an image in the exact same location. And the idea was that you could not only get spatially moved through the space, but temporally as well. So you could stand in one location and move through time. Um, and so there's lots of ways to approach that. I had all the students do videos describing the research. That's an interesting sci-com moment where they go, okay, wait, I, I can't do that in 60 seconds. And yes, you can, go back and try again. Um, Steve Learning comes there, infographics, and we were hitting most of, of the, the habitats out there. So there's actually a link of the VR. This one is a demo um, that you guys can you know, pull up right now if you want. This is one of the key components, and that is that although you can put it into a VR headset and look around that way, you can also do it on a desktop. Interact uh, uh, in that capacity. And that's important because it turns out you put a headset on some folks, they fall over, or pass out, or freak out, or it's claustrophobic, or you know, others are like, well, how come it doesn't have more controls, um, that kind of thing. But um, to be this, this is the limited version like that they were able to put up on the server for the conference. Um, by the end of next week, there'll be a beautiful one for BSA that is in all the habitats with our more slick content that you can use in your classrooms or wherever you wish endlessly. Um, and it, it'll be available, I'll, I'll link it to the abstract. Um, but these things then start, so you can use them on desktop or um, on the phone. And then there'd be a little icon where you hit the goggles, flip it sideways, load it into the headset and put it on, and then you're inside shot. In, um, May 2018. And so I want you to, so I've taken some stills out of the skin, okay, to sort of show you what you would see and experience uh, and, and what that would look like. Sorry. <laughs> Welcome oh, to that's Shaw. me, welcoming you. <laughs> yes, one of the first videos that you get is at the gate of Shaw, and it's me with much shorter hair welcoming you to Shaw to look at our research. Um, it works. It, it does, yeah. So you click on an icon like this, and when you do the VR headsets, by clicking an icon means you just look at it. When you look at it, it loads and pops up. And then to get out of it, you just look away, which is kind of weird. Um, so you get something, you know, where, where there's like a, a little infographic. Um, or I have students, you know, build these as well. Um, there'd be video, so this exact location is where Shaw did a burn, and Mike Saxton did the burn, and so this is that location six months earlier. And so you can look it up and see, you know, students see what happened there, and then 
what kind of diversity that led to. Um, we did uh, underwater shots um, when looking at the Nephalis, and so this is, you can't tell this is actually that pond, but it's just quite covered in uh, Nephalis. We did underwater shots, and, um, and then also they loaded their own their research posters of the work they were doing on them. All of those things can come up uh, within, within the skates. So within the classroom, yes, uh, we have to have um, some pedagogy. I didn't want it to just be, here's some cool new way to look at pictures. That's, that's like, okay, that's gonna go stale real fast. Um, it had to be like an interactive learning. So I did this in upper division botany, and this is always what students look like initially. They put that on and then they just kind of, <laughs> and then they go back to you know. Uh, I think their feet are the most, like, where's my feet is sort of you know, the, the first thing they ask. Um, but what I found was that three times of charms on this. When you're integrating a new technology, it means that the first time you use it is going to be about, does it fit over my glasses, my phone won't fit in, uh, you know, all that kind of thing. So what I did is I played it in three times. So we do a 10 minutes in class with a low stakes assignment. Something like, see if you can find a professor hiding behind the tree. Or find me three pollinators or something like that. Um, buried in there and to integrate with tech. And we did these three classes in a row so that they were learning it quickly. Second time it introduced whatever the assignment was gonna be. So like for ecology this fall, they will put on their headsets and I'll say, great, in, these, in this skin, find me three interactions and then in your partners, you're going to create an infographic that will be embedded to discuss that later. And the third time would be assessment. And this is part I didn't anticipate. I would load up, like for instance, I told them to do infographics about interactions with the plants. Then I loaded that content in and I didn't assess it, I had them put on the headset and see how their content looked. And the first time they looked, I went, these are terrible. <laughs> uh, and and the, the self-assessment um, is, is really an interesting way to use that as well. Um, you can also embed data and then have, and give them questions and they can use that as well to, um, as, as a pedagogical tool. And the other part I didn't anticipate was what became known as the Vines Project, was outreaching to communities where not only is it that it's a bad timing for a field trip, what if your school just doesn't have funds? And this was in um, uh, elementary schools where we went in and, and, and brought in the headset. Oh, eight-year-olds love that. And they, by the way, they nailed that real fast. They did not stumble around. But also um, with um, STEM outreach, we went into some of the um, inner city schools in St. Louis and um, some of these girls are 13 and one of them put the heads on and there was a video of a bee and she went, is that a real bee? I've never seen a bee. And it reminded me, although Shaw is 30 minutes away, it's forever away for some people. And that that's something that we have to address. And here's a technology that can be brought in um, for relatively inexpensively and this grant will be covering to bring that into the schools. Um, accessibility to the natural world in a new capacity. And we have like questionnaires and you know, this is like find where we left our notebook and uh, find Dr. Krekus' favorite plant and things like that. Um, so this is an ongoing project. As I said, it continued to collect skins and to use this in uh, most of my upper division classes, but with the goal of the, my students creating the content that then is embedded for the, the next set of teaching tools. And there were a lot of people that were involved, um, always our connections at SAW and Zertanagorn, but I do have to give a shout out to Sam Harris is an IT team at Maryville who came out once and never again. So, thank you very much. I'll take your question. About one minute for questions. Yes. Oh, in the back. Yes. Did you get a skin from here? So we have a project. One of my students can talk about it, um, and we are doing a from field to, to a conference, where you virtu virtually go from being in the field collecting the data, in the lab processing the data, in the microscope, analyzing the data, to her presenting her data at the poster in the conference. So we will be getting a skin of her by her poster. Emily, where are you? Raise your hand. There she is. We're getting a skin of her with a video of her presenting her poster and then this learning module. But I think what will be interesting is to connect uh, from field to science communication all the way through the process. So that will be a new module. So yes, thank you. So I just have a question. The, the skin looks like, if I'm in Google Maps and I click on a spot and it's got that 360, like a 360 it's the yeah. same thing. 
It is. So what I originally said to the, the, the software is changing constantly. I said, I want a Harry Potter picture, right? Like where it ripples, it's alive. And they said, well, you can have that, or you can have a still image 360 that you can embed content in. We need a year until you can have a live image to embed content in. Ah, hurry up. Mm -hmm. so. All right. Thank you.